Hello everyone. I am myself Dr. Rajesh Gubba. I am the general medicine educator. In this session, I will be doing a quick recap on the topic of the acute complications of diabetes mellitus. So, if you see the acute complications of diabetes mellitus, one important acute complication is the diabetic ketoacidosis and another important acute complication is that is honk. What does this honk stands for? That is hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma. So these two are the acute complications of the diabetes mellitus. Now let me discuss about the DK that is diabetic ketoacidosis. This diabetic ketoacidosis. So what are the acute complications in the type 1 diabetes mellitus? So the acute complication in type 1 diabetes mellitus it is the diabetic ketoacidosis. Let me tell you that diabetic ketoacidosis is also seen in type 2 diabetes mellitus as well. But this is more common in type 1 diabetes mellitus rather than the type 2 diabetes mellitus. And this particular type 1 diabetes mellitus, it is due to severe insulin deficiency, there will be development of DK in type 1 diabetes mellitus. What are the precipitating factors for the development of diabetic ketoacidosis? Precipitating factors include number one, the insulin insufficiency. So insufficient or interrupted insulin therapy can cause the DK. Then infections, either you take respiratory tract infections like pneumonia or urinary tract infections can predispose the individual to develop diabetic ketoacidosis. Then the emotional stress can cause diabetic ketoacidosis excessive alcohol ingestion. So these are the precipitating factors for the development of diabetic ketoacidosis. And you need to know what is the pathophysiology, why there is development of the ketone bodies. See in diabetic ketoacidosis there is severe insulin deficiency. Now because of severe insulin deficiency let me tell you there is a decrease in the glucose intake or decrease in the glucose uptake by the cells. So once there is decreased glucose uptake by the cells, there will be hyperglycemia. Now the cell will be searching for the alternate source of energy because the glucose is not available for the cell. So what the cell will try to do, the cell will try to acquire the energy from the proteins by proteolysis from the lipids by the lipolysis. Meanwhile, what happens is there is hyperglycemia and secondary to hyperglycemia, there is osmotic diuresis. So the glucose along with the water in the form of urine is excreted out. So there will be hypotonic losses. So the other way, I mean the, on the other side, there is proteolysis and lipolysis by the cell for acquiring the energy. So as a part of the proteolysis, there will be synthesis, I mean there will be formation of the amino acids and as well as there is also the nitrogen loss. So these amino acids by the process of gluconeogenesis they are again converted into the glucose and that will further precipitate the hyperglycemia and whenever there is osmotic diuresis let me tell you the electrolytes are also being lost so that will re result in the electrolyte depletion there can be development of dehydration now on the other side whenever there is lipolysis Remember, there is increase in the glycerol levels and there is increase in the free fatty acids. And these free fatty acids, they undergo the process of the beta oxidation and due to which there is ketogenesis and the ketone bodies are being formed. And these ketone bodies are acetone, acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate. And these ketone bodies, they start appearing in the urine resulting in ketonemia. And once they start appearing in the urine, that we, the terminology what we call it as the ketonuria. And what do you mean by the ketonemia? Ketonemia is increase in the plasma ketone bodies. That is what is called ketonemia. So the basic pathophysiology of DKA is decrease in the insulin due to which glucose is not being utilized. Alternatively, there is proteolysis and lipolysis. So this is the pathophysiology of diabetic ketoacidosis. Then the main problems in diabetic ketoacidosis are due to, please remember the main problems are mainly because of the development of acidosis. Why? 
because the ketone bodies whichever are being synthesized they are acidic in nature right they are acidic in nature and there is dehydration so because of hyperglycemia there is osmotic diuresis so the fluid is excreted out resulting in the dehydration so the main problems in diabetic ketoacidosis is due to acidosis and dehydration then followed by that what are the clinical features in diabetes mellitus diabetic ketoacidosis most important there will be nausea and as well as vomiting and there will be abdominal pain as well what exactly is the etiology of the abdominal pain is not known but these individuals they develop the abdominal pain and what is the characteristic breathing pattern in diabetic ketoacidosis this is a very important multiple choice question the characteristic breathing it's a periodic breathing and that is called kusmal's respiration and in the breath it is a fruity order and why is that particular fruity order that is because of the acetone right that is because of the acetone you have a sweet smelling breath and that and the type of breathing is kusmal's respiration or kusmal's breathing then followed by that what are the signs in diabetic ketoacidosis so the signs if you see number 1 you have the signs of dehydration what are the signs of dehydration that includes the dry skin and as well as mucous membrane and there will be a poor skin turgor and altered consciousness and ultimately these individuals they land up in coma so the signs of dehydration are very important in diabetic ketoacidosis and why is that that is because of the glucosuria or there will be osmotic diuresis due to which there will be dehydration next how do you diagnose the diabetic ketoacidosis so very important is you first and foremost there will be elevated blood glucose why because the insulin is not there so there will be decreased utilization of the glucose so there will be elevated blood glucose then there will be formation of the ketone bodies because of the beta oxidation of the free fatty acids due to which you have acetone acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate so this acetone and as well as acetoacetate this will appear in the urine but this beta hydroxybutyrate it will remain within the plasma and let me tell you among all the ketone bodies the most acidic ketone body right the most acidic ketone body it is the beta hydroxybutyrate so please remember it's a very very important point then metabolic acidosis will be there so when you do an abg that is arterial blood gas analysis that will show you the presence of low serum bicarbonate and as well as the low blood ph and there is also increased anion gap so this is how you will diagnose the diabetic ketoacidosis number 1 the urine examination then the plasma ketonemia then the abg will show you the presence of the metabolic acidosis then how do you manage diabetic ketoacidosis please remember you need to give high volume of normal saline and followed by this high volume of normal saline you need to give insulin right you need to give insulin and you need to know what type of insulin is given and how the insulin is given the type of insulin which is been given is you need to give the regular insulin right you need to give regular insulin so initially you will give a bolus of insulin right initially you will give a bolus of insulin and followed by that this insulin it is given in the form of the infusion right followed by that you need to give insulin in the form of infusion and the type of insulin is the regular insulin now how do you start insulin in diabetic ketoacidosis and how do you continue so initially you have to start in the form of iv bolus and iv infusion and later on you need to switch to subcutaneous insulin now the point is when will you switch right when will you switch the iv insulin infusion to subcutaneous formulation that is when the anion gap normalizes because your diabetic ketoacidosis is a high anion gap metabolic acidosis so once the anion gap normalizes and when the serum bicarbonate levels become normal that is the point when you need to switch the iv insulin to the subcutaneous formulation but rem but remember you should never stop iv insulin before starting subcutaneous insulin you should overlap 
right you need to overlap them both for 6 to 8 hours right so do not stop the iv insulin before starting subcutaneous insulin instead overlap them both for 6 to 8 hours this is a very very important point you need to remember regarding the treatment next when will you start 5% dextrose in the management of diabetic ketoacidosis? See, whenever you are giving insulin infusion, there is chance that there will be development of hypoglycemia. But whenever the blood glucose level reaches 200 to 250 milligrams per deciliter, then IV insulin should be given along with 5% dextrose. Okay, see in patients with diabetic ketoacidosis, the blood glucose levels may be initially around 300, 400 or 500. But once you are giving insulin infusion, the blood glucose levels will start coming back to normal. But once the insulin blood glucose level reaches 200 to 250 milligrams per deciliter, that is the point when you need to add 5% dextrose. Then followed by that, what is the electrolyte abnormality associated with diabetic ketoacidosis? The important electrolyte abnormality is diabetic ketoacidosis it is associated with hyperkalemia this is a very important multiple choice question and when do you give potassium supplementation in diabetic ketoacidosis see you have to give potassium supplementation whenever the potassium levels are being depleted the total body level of potassium is depleted because of the urinary loss of potassium right because of the urinary loss of potassium and not only that you are giving insulin infusion and insulin it reduces right it reduces the potassium levels so insulin infusion will cause the hypokalemia so once there is development of hypokalemia that is not even hypokalemia when the potassium levels falls to less than or equal to 5 milli equivalents per liter then potassium replacement should be given right then potassium replacement should be given so the total body level of the potassium is depleted because of the urinary loss of potassium and as a as soon as the potassium level falls to less than 5 milli equivalents per liter potassium replacement should be given this is a very very important point so why because insulin it will reduce the potassium it will shift the extracellular potassium to the intracellular compartment so whenever you are managing diabetic ketoacidosis you need to monitor the serum potassium levels then followed by that you need to know what is honeymoon period in diabetes mellitus see the honeymoon period is an initial episode of diabetic ketoacidosis followed by symptom free interval right symptom free interval during which no treatment is required that is called as the honeymoon period in diabetes mellitus please remember it's a very important point next what is somogi effect we have two phenomenon that you need to remember one is somogi effect and the other one is dawn's phenomenon so what is somogi effect is that these individuals they will have rebound hyperglycemia right they will have rebound hyperglycemia early in the morning secondary to hypoglycemia in the middle of the night right in the middle of the night there will be an episode of hypoglycemia and secondary to this episode of hyperglycemia there is release of the counter regulatory hormones right there will be release of counter regulatory hormones and these counter regulatory hormones will increase the blood glucose levels and what are those counter regulatory hormones that includes your steroid glucagon growth hormone catecholamines thyroid hormone these are all counter regulatory hormones which are released in response to hypoglycemia and that will cause hyperglycemia in the morning that is called the somogi effect next followed by that you need to know what is the dawn's phenomenon see what is dawn phenomenon dawn phenomenon is early morning rise in plasma glucose secondary to rise in counter regulatory hormones like cortisol epinephrine growth hormone for that what you need to do requiring increased amount of insulin to maintain the euglycemia so in dawn's phenomenon there will be early morning hyperglycemia why is that that is because of increase in counter regulatory hormones early in the morning what are those counter regulatory hormones which will increase early in the morning that includes steroids growth hormone and epinephrine so for that what you need to do you need to give the high amounts of insulin in order to maintain the euglycemia so this is about the acute complication that is diabetic ketoacidosis 
honeymoon period dawn phenomenon and then somogi phenomenon thank you very much see you in the next video